The Florida Podcast Network, the voice of Florida. From Mallory Square in Key West to the Governor's Mansion in Tallahassee and all points beyond, you're listening to the Florida Beer Podcast, powered by FloridaBeerBlog.com. Your source for all things related to the craft beer community in the Sunshine State. And now your host, Dave Butler. It is part two of our two-episode series on Miami-Dade County. Welcome back to the Florida Beer Podcast, powered by FloridaBeerBlog.com. This is Dave, your host and author. And if you've been following the blog for the past six-plus years, first of all, congratulations. Second of all, you'll recall that one of the few breweries that really got this project started was Miami Brewing Company, which, interestingly enough, is down in Homestead, very close to where you take US-1 and jump into the Keys. If you've been there, you'll know that Miami Brewing Company is a part of uh, Schnibbly Redlands Winery, which is a full-service winery making country wines, not made out of grapes, but made out of various fruits that are grown in and around the homestead area. Miami Brewing came a little bit later, but they are both owned and the brainchild of Pete Schnebley, a upstate New York transplant who found his way down to South Florida. And we sat down with Pete for a good long interview talking about his background delivering grapes to upstate New York wineries and other beverage producers, making the jump down here to farm fruits, then making the winery and the brewery, plus a good chunk of conversation about some of the legal issues that are currently facing alcoholic beverage producers here in the Sunshine State. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. Before we get started, I do want to let you know that we are available on social media. Find us at Facebook at FL Beer Blog. We're on Instagram and Twitter at Florida Beer Blog. You can find us at floridabeerblog.com seven days a week, 365 days a year. Please make sure to check us out. And before we continue, go ahead and pause this and give us a nice, juicy five-star review on the podcasting app of your choice. Go ahead and like us and subscribe. It really does get the word out. So without further ado, crack open a beer, head down to Homestead with us, and enjoy our interview with Peach Schnebley. And I'll just go ahead and start with how absolutely massive your compound is. Oh, I thought you were going to talk about something else. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> All right. It's going to be like one of those sorts of interviews. There we go. <laughs> yeah. But what's interesting is that the beer was sort of last. No, I guess the restaurant was last. Yeah, before the that became the beer, before that became the wine, right. and before that was the tropical fruit. Right. How did you even get started doing that? Okay, so that goes back to New York State when I was 13 years old, and we lived in the Finger Lakes. And back then, the Finger Lakes didn't really have, they had very big wineries, but not small wineries. Not wineries like we're used to seeing today, boutique wineries. They had massive, like, gallo size wineries. Taylor, Taylor Wine, which is now out of business, was a major winery in New York State. And so when I was 13, I wanted a pair of Converse sneakers and Levi jeans, as you just Heard me tell some of your, your the young some of the, people some that of the are ones. doing a tour here. <laughs> and it was as simple as I needed a job. It paid $2 an hour. And I went out and I weeded a French vinifera vineyard of, I believe it was a uh, Cabernet. It was a 13-acre block. It didn't rain. So the weeds were really hard to pull out. I was on my hands and knees. And so my first job was to weed that vineyard. When I got done, my second job was the Weed Dad Vineyard. <laughs> so I always laugh when I think I, I got a career that started, you know, in, in, in essence there and then worked its way up to we were dealing with grapes. And the grapes led to me knowing all the wineries. Then I hated living in New York State during the winter, of course. Yeah, it's, it's, and you were, you were upstate. I, you know, I was in middle. People say upstate as soon as you get over the George Washington Bridge. So 
it, it, it was the middle of the state. Upstate is Ogdensburg on the St. Lawrence River. So make a long story short, I, w- I was in the middle of, of the state in the Finger Lakes, which is a really great region. Really great region. Beautiful. If you haven't been there, it's, it's prettier than Napa. It's way prettier than Napa. And so I was there when I saw the beginning of the revolution of the boutique winery. And so before that, there was only big wineries. There certainly were no craft breweries in the early 70s. There was Ballantyne and all those, you know, that are big, that are no longer business. And so that's where it started. It started with me working with grapes. I worked my way up from pulling weeds to being second in charge of a $3 million company. I did everything for him from sales to warehousing to you name it. So obviously you've got the growing background and the operations background and all of that sort of built up. What brought you, other than the lack of snow, from central New York all the way down to the last city you see before you head out to the Florida Keys? Well, Dave, I have an MBA with a concentration of marketing, okay? <laughs> so when I moved down here, if I ended up in the Keys, I would have been one of those people with a habit of something that wasn't good for you. Gotcha. With an MBA. <laughs> <laughs> so I stayed with what I knew. I was doing produce, and I started a company called Fresh King with my wife in 94. Okay, gotcha. I moved down in 89, 94, started Fresh King. Fresh King ended up being a $20 million company. We employed 150 people. We were in business for 23 years, and we did extremely well. We sold to Walmart and Publix and supermarkets all over the country. But then I had started the winery in 2004, and we started the brewery in 2011, and we were the first craft brewery outside of Tequesta. Tequesta? Tequesta. Tequesta. I found out Tequesta started like four months before we did or something like that. (laughs) So I was uh, 2011, August, and we opened our doors for the first Grovetoberfest. With Tony. Okay. Yeah. So Tony came down. He goes, I understand you're starting a brewery. I go, yeah. He goes, so <laughs> you got to come. I go, I finished making my beer on Thursday. <laughs> I don't even know what it's going to taste like. And Tony's like, it doesn't matter. You got to come. You know, Tony is just, he's, okay. he's just a great guy. And if it wasn't for him, I'd still be like, I don't know. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so it's interesting because very rarely do you see a business, I hate to use the word for this, but a business that has all three of those sort of key components. Because usually the, the beer is one thing and the wine is what you get off the shelf at Publix. And then with a lot of the beers, kind of something that we talked about before and we definitely will talk about again, everybody's using fruit. You know, especially here in Miami-Dade County, there's so many people that have fruit adjuncts and they're partnering with local farms and whatnot. But you don't have anybody that you need to partner with. You can just partner with yourself because you have all of those. So I guess how fortuitous is it for you and your brewing team to have access to all these wonderful ingredients? And how often are you using your ingredients, your fruit adjuncts in your beers? Well, I would say for sure more than anybody else. And I would say that there is beers that we've done that you just don't know about. You don't put it in a can. We probably should, but we haven't. You know, I got to buy that small canning line. I was that guy that went out and bought the ridiculous canning line from China that now is a good paperweight. I remember that canning line. Yeah, so it's a good paperweight. So this year we're going to look at that canning line that allows us to do many different sizes, do a paper label. And and by the way, the wine business is just exploding with people wanting to do canned wine. So we've already got a very, very large chain that wants to do uh, wine in a can. Quite frankly, there's all these kind of beverages that are, they're mixed together. You know, it's like, where is the difference between that and that? It's starting to get fuzzy. It's it's very fuzzy. I'm interested about the winery this is sort of interesting, but Schnebly is available at Publix throughout most of the state. No. Or they were. I remember were. seeing them. Oh, no. There were. Publix was our number one supporter 
for a long, long time. And then Publix had a president came in, I think, from South Carolina or something, and he had this thing about getting rid of all the racks and all the stores. Really, really famous for having a really cool rack in the produce department. I remember seeing it. And they were hand-painted by local artists. They represented us. They cost me 200 and something dollars a piece, and we sold a ton of wine. You know, we were in, I don't know, two or 300 stores and doing quite well. So the new manager came in, and his directive was throw every rack out. Didn't call us up and tossed our beautiful racks. We don't do well on the shelf next to Mandavi. It's amazing how many local companies do not do well with them. And it's frustrating to see going to other states and seeing other major grocery chains yeah, that are sad. supporting their local a little bit more than yeah. what we don't have, which is a shame. Interesting thing happened, though. So it's like within the week that Publix decided not to carry us. And I don't know if it was a Publix decided not to carry us or Southern Wine decided not to carry us. But it was probably a combination because... Southern Wine was told that they had to cut a third of the SKUs out of the Publix lineup. So were all the other distributors for wine. And so, you know, quite frankly, we were a casualty somehow of that new president that came in and said that. Now, I got a phone call last week. You know, a lot of the Publix managers and, you know, local people down here from West Palm Beach down were friends of mine. And I got a phone call saying, hey, the new district manager really wants to have Schnebley's back into Publix. Good. So they're even talking about maybe allowing us to do a rack again. Now, I don't know if I want to do the $230 rack that was hand-painted again after that. Exactly. But listen, one door opens, one door closes, another door opens. So the same week that Publix and Southern said, we're not going to carry Schnebley's anymore, Walmart corporate called me up. They were driving down the road. They saw our wines, and they go, we want to carry your wine in our stores. Okay. And I'm like, you're from where? And they go, Bentonville. <laughs> I'm like, you got it. I go, whatever you want, it's, it's good. That's amazing. It, it, it's interesting. Walmart's really starting to show up all of a sudden. In fact, my local one had a major cosmetic redo, and all of a sudden they've got I hate to say it, they've got more craft beer than my local Publix does. Well, I will tell you this. The people at Walmart are fantastic. The managers are fantastic. Okay. They don't want anything. They don't They don't ask for anything for free. They're actually having a Christmas party here tonight that they're paying full price for. Interesting. That has, I think, all their managers in South Florida. And they're just great people. But you know, the, the one thing that I'll tell you about Walmart is almost every one of those managers worked their way up. From the bottom. Really? Hmm. So they didn't go out and hire an MBA to come in and run a $100 million retail operation. You know, some of these stores are just massive. Yeah. They took the person that worked their ass off. Interesting. Gave a crap. <laughs> I don't know if I'm allowed to swear, but well, gave yeah, a crap. I, I, I'm, my, the production team will, uh, <laughs> will bleep out anything that they deem to be a little And, and I think the world of them. I think the world of them. That's amazing. They, they treat you with respect. They want us to be successful because we're local. Yeah. And they go out of their way. Now, Target has, has done very well with us. Okay. Very well with us. And Target has got a different personality. Okay. But I can't complain with people that want our product and do a good job with it and put it on end caps. So, you know, I'm very happy with Target. And Publix wants to come back into the fold. We certainly would love it. That's amazing. And I'd actually like to talk about the wines themselves because obviously when people think wine, for the most part, they're thinking a grape wine. And this isn't necessarily that. This comes off of the tropical fruit that you grow on your farms. Yep. And your timing is very interesting. Why? Because yesterday I released the very first grape wine. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Well, I guess my big question is, (laughs) because I know because there are other grape wines wineries in the state of Florida that use Florida grapes, usually being muscadine. Correct. It's not a traditional cab or Correct. Merlot or something like that. So what grape varietal did you use for the wine that you just released? Well, and we probably will do a muscadine grape mm-hmm. wine, and I should have done one already. <laughs> I have really good friends that grow a lot of muscadine grapes. Chautauqua Winery in the Panhandle, very good. We're all... 
the ones that I know were very good friends. I bought my bladder presses from them. Gotcha. So most likely I'll work with them and we'll, we'll bring in some muscadine. But right now what I'm doing is a very cool experiment. Not experiment. It's something that Chip Cassidy, who was the head of the, the wine department of FIU, he and I have been friends forever. We decided we want to have the continental wines, the intercontinental wines. So we're actually going around to different continents, bringing in wine from them and blending them here. Interesting. So we could have a seven continent wine. We yeah. could take seven cabs from seven continents, bring it into here, blend it here, age it here, and for sure it will come out differently than any other place. Interesting. It's something that we've wanted to do for years, and we just got sidetracked. And I hate to say it, but you know, Chip died, uh, passed away a year and a half ago. I miss him dearly. He and Sorry I did a bunch that. of wine trips around the world. But it is something that should have been done and mm-hmm. is being done. And we released our first one yesterday. Well, that was not really an intercontinental wine, mm-hmm. but it was a group of growers out of uh, Argentina, Mendoza okay. Valley, that we went around. We liked what we were seeing. We had a winery make the wine. We brought it up to here. We aged it here. And we just released it yesterday. Awesome. Yeah. And what is that called? Cabernet from Schnebly. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But the other wines are, you're right. Yeah. It's, fruit from here. I mean, you've got an avocado wine. You've That's, got a yeah. Carambola wine. I know we're drinking a an IPA with what you refer to as a passion fruit bomb. Because mm-hmm. you make, or you grow passion fruit here. So we you've do. got a passion fruit wine. you got to drive by the passion fruit vineyard to get here. Really? Yes. It's right in the front. Okay. There, we were wondering what all those trees were. Oh, it's not it, a tree. It's a vine. Okay. So, going north is the vineyard right in front of the movie screen. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, we came from yeah. the other direction, so that's why. But, yeah, you know, I, I don't <laughs> know, Dave, how it happened, but I know how it happened. Bill Wagner, who was the second winer in New York State to form in 1975, same year Gene Pierce started a winery down at Watkins Glen. And so he came on down to visit me, and he's in his late 70s when he came to visit. And he didn't have to do this. He came down as a friend to give some advice to a very much younger friend. <laughs> but I picked grapes on his farm when I was 13 years old, you know. Jeez. So he came on down. He goes, Pete, why don't you make wine from the fruit you have? And at that point, you know, Fresh King was in full force. And I just had an itch to do something, Dave. Yeah. And I don't know why, but I always have these itches, you know. <laughs> and I'm like, I can make wine out of fruit? <laughs> and he goes, you know, grapes are fruit. That comes to the question of, is wine specifically supposed to be fermented grape? And if it's something else, that means that it goes by a different name. And I'm guessing that the answer is technically no. No. Man man or woman decides many of these categories, etc. Okay. And so we are classified as a wine. Uh, We're not, you know, wine is made from honey is classified as a mead. Mm Mm-hmm. So I don't know why they didn't call it honey wine, but they didn't. But there is no other classification for what we make other than strawberry wine or blueberry wine. And in our case, lychee, mango, guava, star fruit, passion fruit. These are what we grow. And this is the wine that we make. That's kind of awesome. And you've got such a great facility. I know that a lot of people will come down here, obviously. Do you get a lot of negative reactions and sort of upturned noses when they hear that the wines aren't made with grapes but with other fruits? And then how do those reactions change when they actually taste the wines? I could easily tell you that when we started, there was some of that. Okay, back then they used to have Appalachians, right? You know what an Appalachian is, Dave. Yeah, the name and control. Probably a lot of the listeners right now don't even understand what that word means. All right, so used to be you had to have an education on the front label of a wine bottle to understand wine. Then TTB said, which is uh, federal government, said, we really don't w- care where you put that information as long as it's someplace on, on the bottle. Mm-hmm. So they put all that critical information that the federal government says is important on the back label. <laughs> and on the front label, you can have whatever you want. And when that happened... And then the flavored vodka, I think, also changed Interesting. people's perception. 
because I grew up with vodka being with OJ. Yeah. And I don't know what else you do with other than a shot. And, yeah. <laughs> you and know. now they've got so many different flavors. And so I think I think the fact that the next generation that came around was used to flavored vodka and was very open to what was local. And for sure, what we're doing here, maybe we started before some other people in the, in the country. But for sure, that is the trend now. People want to have local. Wherever you are, I want local meat. I want local eggs. I want local lettuce. I want local beer. I want local wine. I want local distilled spirits. I want a local story. Yep. We just happen to be lucky that we weren't, you know, 10 or 20 years earlier because I don't know if we would have been accepted, quite frankly. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. We would have been that leper. Yeah. Leopard. (laughs) With spots. So you've got all of these great wines. Of the ones, I guess, which are the ones that are sort of the top sellers, the hot movers, the oh, ones that that's you... that's easy. Passion okay. Fruit, number one. Okay. Lychee, number two. Those two just just fly off the shelf. Passion Fruit almost was never made. Really? It, I made it in my garage at like 11 o'clock at night. <laughs> and it tasted so crazy. I mean, I'm used to wine yeah. made from grapes. Yeah. So when I made this wine made from passion fruit, it was like it was like a bomb blew up in your mouth. <laughs> and that was before I counterbalanced it with sugar. So this was just like acid being thrown in your mouth. Oh, yeah. You know, and you're going, you know, what did I just do? <laughs> and I always say it's kind of like having that that sore on your arm where when you first press on it, it hurts. Mm-hmm. But then for some reason you press on it again. It still hurts, yeah. but you keep on doing it. No, I gotcha. It, it just, it's just completely a different wine. We counterbalance it out. It's the most unique thing. It's, it's a, you've tasted it. It's unlike any other wine ever made mm-hmm. in the history of man. And it is our number one selling wine by far. Interesting. Yeah. And I'm also interested with the lychee because that's not a fruit that I think a whole lot of U.S. people are used to. So you grow the lychees here? Mm-hmm. Yeah, we grow lychees. So. You know, leeches are very hard to grow here. Okay. Uh, With the changing climate, it's made a little bit more difficult. So I can't tell you that it's a thriving business. It is very difficult. You know, it might produce fruit once every five years. So we're fortunate because we have these, you you can see right next to 120 barrel fermenters. And one of them is almost full with leachy juice from five years ago when we had a ridiculously big bumper crop. (laughs) Therefore, the fruit was cheap. I bought the fruit for 50 cents a pound, which if you convert that into a grape, it's expensive. Mm -hmm. And we just filled it up saying we're going to have this so that we can have it for the next four, five, six years until the next bumper crop comes. And it'll stay good that long? Yeah. I mean, we perfected how to do these, how to do these things so that we have it available. And by the way, all lychees are not the same. Really? So we cannot make wine from the Brewster lychee. We have to use the Marisha. Okay? People don't know these things. They're not the same. Brewsters are just sweet. They don't have they don't have big acid to them. Where Marisha is the opposite. It's less sweet but more more acid. Hmm. And all great wines are all about acid. It's not about sugar. Interesting. No. Yeah. Most people, most people think it's about the sugar, and the fact is, sugar just converts to alcohol. It doesn't have a flavor profile. Yeah, no, acid is right. what makes a cabernet a cabernet, a chardonnay a chardonnay, uh, pinot noir a pinot noir. It isn't the sugar. The sugar is the alcohol. Interesting. Never really yeah. thought of it that way. So obviously, we finally come to 2011, and it's just not enough to have a winery <laughs> and a farm. <laughs> You have to add a brewery to the mix. How did that conversation get started? It happened in 2011. There was five years behind the scenes gotcha. getting the rights to have a brewery on his property. But you have a winery. Right. That's not a brewery. <laughs> so the... <laughs> okay. <laughs> so what? Why, I get why and what did you have to go through? Well, here's something that I didn't know anything about, Dave. I didn't know about politics. <laughs> I sold produce. Every day I woke up, we pick, pack, and ship produce. There was no politics involved. It was good or bad, and that was it. And we had the right to do it. 
But on agricultural land, the, the, the Miami-Dade County declared that they wanted to not abide by the rules of the state, okay, which the state had a statute, which is what a state law is for, for a zoning, for, for a winery. So they made us create an ordinance for a winery. So in the process of doing this, which is very painful. <laughs> I'm sure. Okay. I got to know a lot about the law. I got to know all of the commissioners. And they realized what I was doing out here should not have been scrutinized. It should have been embraced. Okay. What I was doing was creating jobs, creating a byproduct of something that was a, I won't say a waste, but certainly was being sold for almost nothing. Yeah. Which is a blemish fruit that was ripe. Okay. And and created a very nice atmosphere for people to go to the country and hang out, like in Napa or Tuscany or or Burgundy. Okay, so why why should Miami Day be different? But they made it difficult for me. So once we got through the first hurdle, then the next one was, well, Pete Schnebly, what else should we have out here in the Redlands? <laughs> and I said, a brewery and a distillery and a restaurant, because they didn't allow me to have a restaurant. But why? Because when you get people sometimes in positions in counties, now they're all gone now, ah. and the people that really helped me really helped me. And they Good. cut through the red tape, like Commissioner Moss, who who just got termed out, but without his help, it wouldn't happen. Alex Pinellas, who was the mayor at the time, these guys knew that what I was talking about was not killing babies. This is about doing what they do in all these other countries and all these other states already. And so we passed these ordinances that had too much restriction on them. So the first thing they passed was like, out of the alphabet, it was A. All right, you can make wine. Dave, you want to hear something crazy? Okay. I was allowed to make wine out of only fruit that was grown in Miami-Dade County. I can live with that. You know what the state told me when I went to get my license? What? I can only use grapes to make wine in order to have a winery. So You know what I did not own? Grapes. Grapes. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you know what I had to do? I had at least 10 acres of grapes in North Florida Jeez. that I was not allowed to process at my winery in Miami-Dade. I did that for seven years. During those seven years, I became political chair for Farm Bureau. Okay. I went up to Tallahassee. Okay. And I said to them, this statute has to be changed because there's a bunch of us that do not grow grapes. Yet, we have a tremendous demand for our wine. And I went back to the county and said, listen, county, if I want to make a grape wine, I should be able to. (laughs) So herein lies my big question with that. Do you think that legislators, the people that are making these rules, do you think that they're being purposefully difficult to work with for some ulterior motive? Or do they genuinely just don't know what's going on? I think I think both. Then I think the more that you say no in government, the bigger your department becomes because now you've got to process that paperwork that you said no because people like me don't freaking give up. Okay? So I don't know if anybody knows me, <laughs> but nobody knows me as a person who failed. Okay? I'm persistent. I might not get it right today or tomorrow, but I don't give up. Nice. And so it's happened over time that we change these laws. And, and quite frankly, there's the three-tier system from Prohibition was established to get rid of the mafia mm-hmm. out of alcohol. <laughs> and, and put the mafia in other hands. Well, the mafia is no longer in alcohol, has not been since Prohibition. <laughs> Yet you can have Kellogg's Corn Flakes sold directly to anybody that wants to buy Kellogg's Corn Flakes. Yeah. And yet there's, there's laws that say you cannot do that with alcohol. And it's just wrong. It's, you know, it's because people in the middle are making so much freaking money. Yeah. You know, and, and I know some people don't want to hear that. Mm-hmm. You know, but quite frankly, if you were in my shoes, you would feel this way. And by the way, did, did the consumer benefit from the distributor? It's a simple question. Yeah. And if the and by the way, everything is based on the consumer, isn't it? I would hope so. 
So all of our legislators in Tallahassee should be looking at what's in the consumer's best interests. Mm-hmm. And in the wine industry, they created a fantastic law. Okay, that allows us to distribute our own wine, manufacture it, distribute it, and sell it here on the property if we produce 250,000 gallons or less. Okay. That law does not exist for breweries. It does not exist for distilleries. Should it? Without a doubt. Why? Because we don't have enough distributors to satisfy the number of producers that are making these products. Yeah. So, therefore, the consumer didn't benefit because he can't buy it. <laughs> correct? No, you're absolutely correct. And it's interesting to see how frustrating a lot of the laws are. Yeah. And especially when you talk about things like self-distro, which I know has already come up in Tallahassee twice. Mm-hmm. It's failed twice. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They're going to try again next year. Yep. You would think that it would be a no-brainer because it's just promoting Florida businesses. Why do you think it's a no-brainer? Because from what I've seen, being able to self-distribute is the only way that some of the really small people are going to be able to get a keg or two out into the marketplace. No, that's why it should be. Yeah. Why do you think it isn't? Well, happening? I can tell you exactly why. I know you can. The middleman. Huh? The middleman. Right. The, middle the lobbyist, the the money. lobbyist exactly. for the middleman has millions and millions, and in some cases, billions of dollars of income coming in. And me, I've got a lot less money coming in, and therefore it's we're up there fighting this bureaucracy that is taking people out to dinner and buying them a you know a Ruth Chris steak, which is great steak. <laughs> <laughs> and the things that have happened are amazing. You know, there wasn't even a right to sell your own beer in a tap room when we started. You couldn't sell a freaking growler. Yeah, but it's funny that you mentioned the growlers because I'm taking a look at your taps and you've got 32-ounce growlers yep. and you've got 64-ounce growlers, yeah. which were illegal right. when you first started making your beers. Yeah. Crazy. Which, yeah. But the 128-ounce growlers were not illegal. <laughs> yeah, That's right. the best part. That's the kicker yeah. for, for me. It's simple, Dave. It's simple. <laughs> All right. All you people that are listening, this is not complicated, Okay. Get a hold of your legislators. Find out who they are. Okay? And us as a collective organization, can, we are swinging that pendulum in a direction that benefits us. And it's going to happen. It will happen. The laws are changing. They've, they've changed so much. Mm-hmm. And quite frankly, it, you know, I, well, you need a distributor. I don't want to distribute beer. <laughs> you know? I mean, <laughs> I don't. But I also don't want to say that they have the rights to me for the rest of my life. Yeah. They don't even have that in in professional baseball that's protected by by the government. So there is more protection with a distributor with beer than there is with a baseball player signing on with any baseball team that I can't get out of a contract if I'm in it. (laughs) <laughs> well, I was going to actually ask, because one of the things that I want to do is go over some of the beers that you have on sure. tap. With the beers that you have, when you started, you had the four main cans. Right. And it, you still have Big Rod and Shark, Shark Bait, Bait. But you also had Gator Tail, and I'm missing one. Miami Vice. Miami Vice. Yeah. So you've got Miami Vice, you've got Shark Bait, you've got Big Rod on draft right now right but from what we've said before in the past it seems that you're going to take the images take the ideas take your core lineup and once you get the new canning system kind of push out into the world a newer more revamped lineup yeah well what's beautiful about what's happened Mm -hmm. is that people accept the paper label on a can of beer gotcha thank you thank you consumer for not being so freaking picky to say that we have to produce 10,000 cans of pre-printed cans <laughs> <laughs> that we can put a paper label on it. That really is pretty cool labels. We can make them up as whimsical as we want to be. It's funny. I'm actually going to give a shout out to my producer, Steve, who has almost completely filled up two cornhole boards 
with the labels that he's peeled off mm. of the cans that mm-hmm. he's really liked. Mm-hmm. And I kind of want to mention that because one of the images that you have, and I don't know if you have them right now, but what I was going to say is the new shark bait label mm. is absolutely fantastic. Is that sort of a, yeah. a, a, a glimpse of things to yes, come? Yes, yes. You know, it, it came out so freaking good that it, it's inspired us. There's people that design stuff that do a lot better job than I do. Well, I was going to say, do you have those cans here? No, oh, shark bait, yes. When you do a pre-printed can, it's harder. So a pre-printed can is when you're, you know, like Cigar City is, is massively selling beer. And when you do that, you're not going to do a paper label. You're going to do a pre-printed can. Why? Because your can costs you 9 to $0.10, cents, whether it's printed or not. So, of course, you're going to say, go ahead and print it. Yeah. All right. Now, they're making so much of that beer that you you want that. You want that savings. Now, when you put a label on a can, now you've got the same cost plus the cost of the label. So that's that just comes down to economics. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Yeah. And then with the actual beers themselves, what's going to be coming into cans? What's going to be getting re- that redesigned and re-released into the market? People that you can hire out there. And my son uh, was a big influence, Cody. And I'm trying to remember the name of the company that has artists. And it's on the, it's on the internet. And I, it's a simple name. Fiber. It's Fiber. Okay. So we went out to Fiber and we hired some people for 25 bucks and we said, "Here's here's what we want you to do." And quite frankly, that's how we got our label. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Now, that's a very good way to do it. Very cost effective. The other thing we do is we have our festivals here. And we have our gravel bike racing series that starts up in January. And that's a, a brand new sport that you may or may not have heard of. I don't think I have. Okay, so this is something that's only happened in the last five or six years. It's really a racing bike with bigger tires, more so than a mountain bike. So it doesn't really have shocks and all that stuff. But People have been getting killed on the roads because people are texting and driving and speeding and everything else. Mm-hmm. And so we have the Everglades is we can see the Everglades from here. Yeah. So we started doing these races because they came to us and they go, we want to do a gravel bike race at your place. And I'm like, what does that mean? Well, it's a silver sized tire. So it goes well on gravel and they go out to the Everglades. We have all these different paths. We get 250 to 450 riders. Nice. Okay. That are all into nature and into sports and into all that stuff. So the brewery was a natural fit since we got 30 acres. That's kind of amazing, yeah. To have people come with their campers. They came. <laughs> I mean, it is just, it feels like a bluegrass festival, <laughs> you know, with gravel bike bikes. That's amazing. So if you don't know about it, you'll start to see it show up more and more on our social media and our website. And it is a lot of fun. I own a gravel bike. You feel safe. You're not near cars. There's no cars. You're not going to get hit. <laughs> you know, the, the, the alligators leave big people alone. But okay. <laughs> so yeah, you don't have to worry about the alligators nice. in your nature. That's funny. So that lychee festival, we've been doing it every year. We couldn't do it last year, obviously. Yeah. And then with the movie screen... We did two big concerts. We did Metallica. Really? Yep. So we did Metallica about four months ago, and it was a simulcast. Nice. So it was a drive-in, 300 car, 1,200 people, special view, and I think there was, I don't know, four or 500 locations around the country. We were picked as one. Oh, nice. Because we got a lot of room. Mm-hmm. And we got that 60-foot screen, and we, we had a Metallica concert. Then a month later, we had Kane Brown. Oh, wow. And this is, you know, stuff that, you know, you know, there's a lot of my friends, Winwood Brewing and uh, all the ones in Winwood. You know, you've got a bunch of the breweries that they, you know, they, they don't have 30 acres. You know, wineries do, though. Mm-hmm. So this got attached mostly to wineries. You know, so really it was more like Schnebly Winery was doing it, but Miami Brewing Company was doing it because yeah, we're all exactly. on the same property. You know, <laughs> there's one, there's an arm, there's an arm and a leg attached. You know, 
Mm-hmm. But it's the coolest freaking thing. So it allows us to do stuff like that and introduce people to our beers and our wines and you know and all the other stuff we're going to yeah. be doing in the future. So I was going to say, especially with a location like this, it's you know obviously the beer and the wine and the food is good, but it's it's really about in a large part having a location like this is partially about producing the product and mm-hmm. then partially about tourism mm-hmm. and coming in. And in fact, when you come in through the front door, is the first thing you have to pass is a big list of all the other attractions that are in the Redlands area yeah. and how far away they are. Yeah, we call ourselves the Disney World for adults. <laughs> You've heard me say that before. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and it's simple to understand. And that is that we want to scratch that itch yeah. that adults have to go to a place that's for them, but we didn't leave the kid out. Yeah. So we don't necessarily tell you, hey, listen, this is an adult place and you can't bring your kids. Mm-hmm. And hey, the reason why is I had kids. Exactly. And they hated going to wineries. <laughs> okay? So when I was trying to research it, I was like, Dad, are we going to another winery on, on our trip? And I'm like, <laughs> yeah. Mom's going to stay with you in the parking lot while I go in and try some wine. So we took into consideration that we don't want to be a kid's attraction. Mm-hmm. But we do things here so the kids aren't bored and they love coming. Yeah. Simple as that. So we got the courtyard that they can run and jump. And And my daughter took full advantage of that already, as you can see. But we're sitting there drinking an adult beverage. Yeah. Watching our kids have fun meeting other kids. Versus we don't know where they are. They're wandering around 30 acres. No, no, no. We structured a place that we know where our kids are. Or we don't. <laughs> they got out. <laughs> I should probably check on my kids. Yeah. So I will leave you with this. And I do find it kind of interesting because with Schnibley Winery, you can ship anywhere in the U.S., correct? Yes. And you cannot do that with Miami Brewing? No. Even though it's the same 30 acres? It's ridiculous. <laughs> and you, the, you, the listener today, can influence this because it all... listen. Dave, it came down to this. I was going to hire a lobbyist to lobby in my benefit. Okay. It was going to cost me, back then it was $500 an hour. And I told the lobbyist, when you go in to talk to these people, do not be nice to them. Okay. I want you to tell them that this is a right that we should have. Yeah. Do not, do not be nice to them. So after the first day, oh, I took so-and-so out to lunch. I go, you did what? I took so-and-so out to lunch. I said, well, do me a favor if you would. What's that? Send me your bill, and Mm -hmm. you're fired. (laughs) Good. Those are the words that came out of my mouth. Gotcha. So we, the people, have to stand up for the right that we're being screwed. Okay? Absolutely screwed because we cannot buy these products, okay, directly from the producers. Yeah. And the fact is, is that you've got adult signatures that can happen on FedEx and UPS. Mm-hmm. Okay. There is no rhyme or reason for it. It will go away eventually. It will have maybe a modification in the meantime. Yeah. Distributors will still be in business, by the way. They will not own the 1,000-foot yacht <laughs> that they own now. Yeah. Okay. They will still be distributors because we do not want to run down the road like a milk truck no, delivering no. milk to the supermarkets. But they, we will have our rights to choose who we want to be with and have our rights to say, if you don't do your job right, we can get rid of you. Yeah. Which, which is the right thing to do. And I think a lot of people are surprised when they hear that that is not a right that breweries have here in the state of Florida right now. We have good distributors in this state, and we have bad players in this state. Okay? Yeah. And I'm not going to say anything other than every state's the same. And so by making everybody have the right to be able to walk out the door, if you don't do a good job for Mm -hmm. for me, Mm -hmm. we'll make you a good player. And there will be a distributor for everybody. Not for everybody. I'm sorry. There will be a distributor out there that may not be... This Goliath distributor. Yeah. But there will always be an opportunity to form a distribution company to represent four or five brands, which is maybe all you need. Yeah. 
Oh, right? That makes perfect sense. Yeah. Where can people find information on this lovely Disneyland for adults that you have built? In the middle, where can people find information on this lovely Disneyland for adults that you have built in the Florida oh. Everglades? Well, if you go to schnebblywinery.com, miamibrewing.com, you certainly will find us. All you really need to do is Google wineries in Miami-Dade. Probably Miami Brewing, it, it'll come up, but there'll probably be a bunch of other breweries. But we're the only winery here. I, I think we come up number one in the state in almost every category. Oh, nice. We're not the biggest. I mean, as far as, as, far as the number of bottles we sell. Mm-hmm. But I think we've been recognized, Dave, as being at Disney World for adults. Nice. And we're, we're very proud of what we do. We're not going to change. We're good people. We just want to be able to make these products that people want. And I'm come visit. I'd rather have you visit me <laughs> than visit any place else. Well, of course, to buy our product. Of course, you know. And we'll take care of you here, by the way, because we got, by the way, almost a five star rating. Nice on restaurant and everything we do here. So we really, really do care about you know people having a good time. Perfect. Yeah. That is great to hear. Thank you so much. This has been a long time coming, but I'm definitely glad that I was able it to has. finally come back down. Hey, and I'll tell you this, Dave. If anybody wants to come down and go to a free movie, uh huh. All right, send an email to me, Peter at Schnebblywinery dot com. Say I love Dave. <laughs> he has no. Just say I love Dave. We'll keep it simple. Okay. And I will send you some tickets to come to a movie here for free. That is amazing. You heard right, it my here. My pleasure. You heard it here first, folks. <laughs> Pete Schnebbly, thank you so much for your time. I really oh, do appreciate it. Thanks for coming it. down. Hey there, fellow Florida beer enthusiast. We now have an official Patreon. In case you are unfamiliar, Patreon is a great way for a community to support the creators of the content you love, like the Florida Beer Podcast. If you're enjoying the content we bring you on this show, or any of the shows on the Florida Podcast Network, you can help ensure that content keeps coming through for a small monthly donation equal to the price of a couple cups of coffee a month. So for just a few lattes you can make a real difference. And the first goal of FPN's Patreon program is to help me get a better mobile setup to use whenever I can start traveling to great breweries here in the state of Florida. So if today's episode brought you valuable insights and information, please help see that these episodes keep coming by becoming a patron. Head to patreon.com slash Florida Podcast Network to support the show, and it comes with some pretty sweet benefits. Want access to bonus extras? Nostalgic for these old school radio shout outs? Lover of good quality merchandise? Well, not only will your monthly contribution help me grow the show, but you'll get some cool stuff in return. So please head to patreon.com slash Florida Podcast Network for further details to become a patron. That's Patreon. P A T R E O N dot com slash Florida Podcast Network. You can also find the link right there in the show notes or by visiting FloridaBeerPodcast.com. Thank you in advance for your continued support. You can see pictures of that new can design for shark bait on our social media channels. And we will definitely be excited to see what other products they have coming down the pipeline. Believe me, they'll be showing up on Florida Beer Blog. The Florida Beer Podcast is a production of FloridaBeerBlog.com and Florida Beer Media. You can find us at FloridaBeerMedia.com as well. We are on social media at Florida Beer Blog, at Twitter and Instagram. Facebook, we're FL Beer Blog. We are also a very proud production of the Florida Podcast Network, and you can find more information on the amazing shows on the network by going to Facebook and searching for FPN Insiders. It's our closed members-only Facebook group where you can find out more information about the great shows coming to the network. Talk to your favorite hosts. Let us know where you've been, what you've been listening to, and so on. There's going to be a lot of great shows coming down the pipeline, so please go on to Facebook right now, search for FPN Insiders, and join. You are not going to miss any of the fun. Our intro announcer is Jeff Brozovich. 
Field producer is Steve Piccola. Executive producer in Grand High Poobah is Jemmy Lagonier. Make sure to subscribe to us, rate us, give us a nice juicy five stars, tell all of your friends, hijack the lights that are on the side of the Intercontinental Hotel, and instead of dancing people, just flash, listen to Florida Beer Podcast. Trust me, you won't get any trouble. Thank you so much. This is Dave, your host and author. We will see you in a few weeks with another couple great stories from brewing here in the Sunshine State. Make sure between now and then to drink Florida Craft.